Mr. Chair, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the 110th uh, session of the IOM Council. I'm proud to be here today as I begin my second year in office reporting on our activities and progress as an organization. This year has passed quickly, but even for this relatively short period, we have much to report, both in terms of what we are doing on the ground, as well as how we are developing as an institution. This year, IOM's budget is projected to exceed 2 billion US dollars for the first time, an increase of 13% on the 2018 budget. Correlated to this, IOM's staff, as of June 2019, numbered 13,844, an increase of 21% on a year earlier. This growth is for any organization extraordinary. For IOM, however, it represents a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the need for our work in the field, whether responding to crisis situations or building capacity to respond to growing mobility, is of course expanding. On the other hand, this demand is placing further strain on the organization's core functions. We are clearly popular and essential, yet fragile. In the current scenario, the current proposal for the 2020 budget reflects that only 1.5% of the staff posts of the organization are funded from the assessed contributions. Increasing pressure on operational support income to cover essential functions and services. This reinforces the need to address these limitations with the member states, and I look forward to your active involvement in these discussions. These challenges are at the heart of the administration's work during 2019 to establish two parallel processes of reform. I have led the process to develop an overarching vision for the organization, setting a course for IOM to meet uh, the demands of the next decade of migration. At the same time, the Deputy Director General has been central to the development of the internal governance framework designed to strengthen our internal processes to meet the requirements of a modern for purpose organization. In both these endeavors, our orientation phase is complete. You have received the final version of the five year strategic vision and our most recent update on the application of the internal governance framework. We are now working towards the complex, multi layered process of implementation for which I hope we can count on your support. I will return to these later. As much as our growth indicates, IOM has been active in responding to acute new and long-standing humanitarian situations. With over 30 million IOM beneficiaries in 2018, an upward trend that continued throughout 2019. Across the world, crisis situations continue to emerge or remain unresolved, displacing millions from their homes with few prospects for swift resolution. Displacement levels thus remain staggering across many parts of the world. Internal displacement situations have become protracted, with few exceptions, and continue to require large-scale responses. Migrants also continue to suffer from tremendous abuse and hardship in some key contexts. The proliferation of this situation is challenging to organizations such as IOM in a number of ways. First, IOM, as is the case for the broader international humanitarian community, is seeking record levels of humanitarian financing in order to respond 
to multiple crises around the world. While the scale of IOM operations has grown tremendously in some key contexts in recent years, including in Bangladesh, Iraq, Libya, Nigeria, South Su Sudan, the Syrian Arab Republic, and Yemen, a significant number of IOM relief and recovery operations also remain critically underfunded. Year after year, despite the scale of the needs and severity of the situation of the displaced and their host communities. This includes situations across a large section of Central and West Africa. Second, in contexts where instability, violence and poverty are rough, more and more people resort to mobility as both a coping and protection mechanism. This has given rise to large movements of Venezuelans across South America and the Caribbean. In other settings, migrants continue to suffer, to suffer overwhelmingly from broader instability. In Libya, the situation of migrants remains dire, particularly for those who are placed in detention. Similar situations have constantly arisen in Yemen, where migrants originating from the Horn of Africa often face the abuse of human traffickers. In trying to navigate a complex and volatile situation such as Libya, where solutions are scarce, IOM is now considering whether new approaches may be warranted. While the organization will continue to offer life-saving and other forms of humanitarian assistance to migrants, irrespective of the context in which they find themselves, IOM's engagement should also be based on a more comprehensive approach to the issue of migration to and through Libya in a manner that respects the prerogatives of the state while being respectful of migrants' fundamental rights and protection needs. The deteriorating situation in the Sahel and the combined adverse effects of poverty, population growth, scarce resources and environmental change, and the ongoing threats posed by non-state armed groups highlights that the volume of outward migration experienced by the subregion is unlikely to diminish in the short term as the impetus to move remains high and those who decide to travel are willing to take enormous risks. This is one of the reasons why IOM is investing strongly in the resilience of communities in West Africa, including migrants and the internally displaced. It is ever more important that we address situations before they become acute through development programming and human capital investment and offer means for individuals to reintegrate and prosper once they have made the difficult decision to return, whether from Libya or elsewhere. Resilience is also necessary in places where changing climate and extreme weather events are having a deep impact on both short-term displacement and humanitarian response, such as in Bangladesh, where around 1.7 million people were displaced in the first half of this year, mainly because of weather conditions, or the situation of the Rohingya refugees living in camps while monsoons, cyclones, and flooding events create deep upheaval for the population already at its most vulnerable. <coughs> Earlier this year, two cyclones, Idai and Kenneth, affected millions of people in Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. While six months later, the number of who remain displaced has definitely fallen to a few thousand. Crop damage caused by the cyclones has left up to 12 million across southern Africa severely food insecure, particularly in Zimbabwe. There is a need for greater investment in building the disaster response capacities of national and local authorities to reduce long-term dependence on the international community and the longer-term impacts of sudden and extreme events. However, access can also be a challenge. 
The fragility in parts of the world <coughs> inhibits IOM from providing full support to some populations. Multiple IOM offices face difficulties in assessing populations in need of assistance, largely as a result of challenges to the safety and security of IOM staff and operations. The tragic killing of IOM health workers in South Sudan last month, and unfortunately yesterday we had the very sad news that one of the persons abducted has also died, was a stark reminder of the challenging circumstances faced by our IOM teams on the ground. Those adverse circumstances extend to such locations as Afghanistan, Somalia, the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela, and Yemen. Throughout the world, working conditions for IOM staff continue to worsen, a particular challenge given IOM's deep field presence. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the resumption of violence in the eastern part of the country earlier this year not only displaced thousands of people, <coughs> but the lack of access for humanitarian workers also limited critical support, not least in Ebola-affected areas of the country. Responding concurrently to such a large number of situations is often very difficult in, in often very difficult operating environments with limited access and limited local capacity has presented considerable challenges for IOM. It has also forced the organization to invest in establishing more effective approaches with greater resources allocated towards areas such as emergency preparedness, early warning mechanisms, and capacity building. These efforts go hand in hand with IOM's commitments to the Grand Bargain, which remain relevant and organization-wide institutional efforts to build a more effective and efficient IOM. Nonetheless, while political solutions may be a distant reality, IOM has continued to assist displaced persons and affected communities in progress towards durable solutions. Many of the situations to which IOM has responded are indeed emergency situations. While unpredictable, they are not, however, unforeseen. Our responses are increasingly informed by our previous experiences on the ground and also the data that we collect. The IOM Displacement Tracking Matrix, DTM, was deployed in 66 countries during the first half of 2019, tracking the movement of over 24 million internally displaced persons and has definitely become the standard for monitoring levels of internal displacement within the humanitarian sector. In addition, the DTM has begun to integrate protection and gender-based violence indicators into its operations, which allows for the identification of particularly vulnerable groups. This is critical in fast-paced situations for fast response. In the Southern American region, IOM is working closely with those governments hosting Venezuelan nationals to ensure the safety and protection of those on the move, while also responding to the needs of those governments to help them identify how many and who are in their countries. While this is a crisis situation of epic proportions for the region, evidenced at the International Solidarity Conference held last month in Brussels, we should also take note of some of the innovative policies and practices which have emerged in the region as a result. For example, in Trinidad and Tobago, where IOM has cooperated with the government to register the people on the move and to allow them to have access to the labor market and public services. We are running a similar program in Ecuador, where nearly 180,000 individuals have been registered in this regard. We have proposed a regional identification card 
under the auspices of the Quito process, which we believe will minimize the risks to those on the move, and particularly their vulnerability to smugglers and traffickers. IOM has also been working with governments and local authorities in the region, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Peru, to facilitate access to social services and integration for migrants and refugees. This kind of capacity building is core to IOM's work. For example, in June 2019, nearly half of IOM offices reported that they were supporting governments to develop and improve labor market frameworks and practices, such as in Zambia, through bilateral labor agreements for the protection of Zambian nationals working abroad, or in Fiji, where IOM has established a labor market information system for Kiribati and Tuvalu. During the first half of this year, IOM provided training and technical assistance to more than 45,000 governments, civil society, and private sector partners, as well as local community leaders, to strengthen the protection of migrants vulnerable to violence, exploitation, and abuse, such as victims of trafficking. This is vital. Too often, we witness manageable situations descending into crises owing to a lack of capacity. Even today, Many countries lack the basic reception and support capabilities to manage new arrivals or cater for specific needs, particularly in a very acute case, those of unaccompanied minors. As the recent tra tragedy in the United Kingdom reminds us, we must remain vigilant to the dangers of smuggling and trafficking of people and the potentially horrendous outcomes. IOM has been working with authorities in both the United Kingdom and Vietnam to counter trafficking, demonstrating the need to take a joined up approach with authorities in origin, transit, and destination countries, and not just governments. The IOM Crest Initiative, Corporate Responsibility in Eliminating Slavery and Trafficking, demonstrates the power of private sector actors in promoting ethical recruitment and stronger standards in supply chain management across Asia. We cannot simply consider migrants as beneficiaries of our work. They should also be viewed as empowered partners in establishing new futures and contributing to sustainable development more broadly. Supported by the European Union Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, IOM is now beginning to see the fruits of that investment with the creation of livelihood activities for some 30,000 West Africans, both returning migrants and others in the broader community. It should not come as no surprise, it should come as no surprise that many of the issues that I have outlined so far are reflected in the Global Compact for safe, orderly, and regularly migration. This reinforces that for us, the Global Compact is a very relevant guiding marker of progress that is already being undertaken by states, and I'm glad to say that today there has been the first implementing meeting of the Global Compact in Bangladesh at national level, and can be a key tool for governments to further focus their investment. In this regard, IOM has already been offering technical and policy support to governments, both national and local, as well as building cooperation with other United Nations agencies. Partnership with governments is not the only means of realizing stronger migration governance. Indeed, IOM is witnessing and supporting greater collaboration between governments, whether through regional consultative processes or other regional structures. We are also increasing our engagement <coughs> with civil society groups, and in this context, I look forward for the next summit meeting of the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which will take place in Quito in January next year, hosted by the government of Ecuador. With migration highlighted as a key megatrend by the United Nations, 
IOM has also been active in cross-cutting conversations. At the Climate Action Summit, held during the General Assembly week in New York, <laughs> IOM, alongside with the governments of Portugal and Fiji, co-hosted a ministerial breakfast to discuss the situation of small island and developing states, outlining the critical need to respond to build resilience within the most affected populations. And during the same week, IOM welcomed the landmark political declaration on universal health coverage with its explicit mention of the particular needs of migrants and recognition of critical migrant relevant issues such as complex emergencies, climate change, and international migration of health workers. Next year, IOM will give active support alongside the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs to the high-level panel on internal displacement, which was launched by the United Nations Secretary General last month. This is a unique opportunity to tackle the protracted nature of internal displacement, identify best practices, and work towards durable solutions. At country level, IOM is actively engaging in United Nations reform, working with other agencies to ensure that migration is fully integrated into the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation frameworks. In this regard, the establishment of the UN Network on Migration has been key to promoting coherence at all levels. We have made solid progress in setting up the network during the course of 2019. A fuller briefing to member states is scheduled for 12 of December, where we will have the opportunity to review our efforts this year while also looking ahead to next year. The process of establishing coordination structures at the country and regional levels is definitely intensifying. I have always maintained that the key to our work will be the extent to which we can ensure the network is viable where it matters most, on the ground, supported where appropriate by strong, responsive headquarters expertise. In 2020, I expect to see signs of this new way of working in the UN coming together for tangible results, which I will elaborate a little bit later. And lastly, good governance of migration is more difficult without strong knowledge and evidence on the changing dynamics and drivers of migration. In this regard, IOM is consolidating its position to provide to member states and to the international community essential data. Tomorrow, we will launch the 2020 editions of IOM's flagship publication the World Migration Report. By their very nature, the complex dynamics of global migration can never be fully measured, understood and regulated. However, as the report shows, we do have a continually growing and improving body of data and information that can help us make better sense of the basic features of migration in increasingly uncertain times. Looking forward, the two processes I have launched in 2019 to strengthen internal governance and to, to set a strategic direction for the organization <coughs> will now begin to bear fruit. As noted at the most recent meeting of the Standing Committee on Programs and Finance, we will build a stronger IOM through instruments in, in investments in internal justice, <coughs> including tackling sexual exploitation and abuse, and I invite you to see the exhibition that we have in a booth outside this room on uh, this uh, very key and crucial subject of preventing and fighting sexual exploitation and abuse, which will continue in 2020. We will build a more effective IOM by embarking on a business transformation process. We will build a more strategic IOM by developing regional and thematic strategies derived from the five-year strategic vision and be ready to take on 
the challenges of the next decade. I would like to set out more concrete timelines for implementation for both the internal governance framework and the strategic vision. First, however, I wish to emphasize that IOM is not starting from scratch. But, for example, IOM may not have an innovation strategy, but innovation is already built into the DNA of the organization. For IOM staff, innovation is merely the problem solving they undertake every day, everywhere, overcoming barriers which traditional practices cannot overcome. As I indicated in the SCPF, IOM's enterprise resource planning system, the informatic system we use, will reach the end of its functional life at the end of 2025, and the organization is taking this opportunity to embark on a major business transformation process. The planning for this transformation has already begun under the auspices of the internal governance framework. The solution must enable our objectives of increased responsiveness, transparency, control, and informed decision making. In addition to the technology solutions, a comprehensive set of work will be required to align our policies and procedures. To ensure the organization is ready for the new work methods and systems, a comprehensive change management program will be integrated from the beginning. This work will initially involve communications and dialogue with our regional and country office and administrative centers to gain mutual understanding and ensure that the solutions developed meet the goal of improving field operations. Yes, the goal is to improve field operations. From the strategic vision, we have derived a series of strategic objectives, which are now being translated into a second generation results-based management framework, which will ensure that IOM's work can be mapped against key documents, such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Global Compact. In terms of implementation, there are three broad components. Foundational cross-cutting elements, regional level strategy development, and thematic and institutional strategy development. The foundational elements are closely linked to the internal governance framework and are key enablers of the strategic vision. First, there is a need to enhance IOM's capabilities, from developing IT systems to support knowledge management and data analysis, to developing more comprehensive results-based management, monitoring, and evaluation. Second, any deep organizational change requires both a change in the mindset within an organization, as well as support to develop new skills for those in key positions. We are already seeing teams across IOM reflect on how the three pillars of the vision, resilience, mobility, and governance, may affect how they approach their area of work. IOM staff will need to have the time and resources to invest in the reflection and engagement that will be demanded of IOM in the future. The policy hub launched in April this year is one key enabler of this process, supporting staff in possession of unique field expertise to develop organization-wide learning from their activities, underwritten in many cases by a near mark and flexible funding. At this moment, a series of regional and sub-regional strategies are being developed across the organization, which draw from both the priorities of the strategic vision and the realities on the ground at field level. This process is designed to align regional strategies to cover the same period of time, 2020, 2024, following a broad template while fully respecting regional context and specificities. In addition, and innovating, IOM is developing 
a pan-African strategy, which will offer a more strategic perspective on the organization's engagement in the continent and engagement with key regional governance structures, such as the African Union. These regional strategies will then inform country-level planning. Lastly, a number of institutional and thematic strategies are being developed across the organization, working across programmatic areas. IOM data strategy is currently being finalized and will be presented to the member states in early next year. The strategy sets out key objectives in three areas. Strengthening the global evidence base on migration, developing the capacity of member states and other partners to enhance the migration evidence base, <laughs> and enhancing the use of migration data for evidence-based programming and policy advice, and combine these with a series of proposed initiatives to realize them. With respect to knowledge management, the policy has been collecting and mapping existing means of developing collective intelligence across IOM and offering support to initiatives across the organization that are designed to bring knowledge together. In addition to this, a migration policy repository, which collates all the policy work that IOM has undertaken in recent years, is currently being piloted with full rollout expected early next year too. At the Standing Committee on Program and Finance last month, my colleagues presented IOM's first thematic strategy, the institutional strategy on migration and sustainable development. This will now move into its implementation phase, while a series of other strategies on environmental degradation and migration, identity management, and resettlement, inter alia, begin to be articulated. Not all IOM's thematic reviews will lead to a strategy. In some cases, as with IOM's ongoing working group to develop our policy on the full spectrum of return, readmission, and reintegration, the focus is on bringing together and clarifying IOM's institutional position on such a complex issue. All of this strategic development may seem probably to a cynic, to be naval gazing at a time when IOM should be looking outward. In truth, it is a means to ensure that IOM's external partnership rests on stronger foundations to the mutual benefit of the member states and of the organization. In order to ensure that its operational work is more effective, IOM needs to understand what works and what does not. In order to participate fully in the United Nations reform and propose necessary development programming on the ground, IOM needs to understand and to master its own long-term objectives. Through this strategic development, IOM will be able to contribute more robustly to the United Nations system as a whole, respond more effectively to the requests of member states, and meet the needs of migrants worldwide. As the United Nations approaches its 75th anniversary and contemplates its future role, such thought leadership for IOM in the migration field can only be timely. As you can see, 2020 will be a busy year and one in which strong management and leadership will be the key. In a couple of weeks, we will mark the one year anniversary of the Global Compact and host the first annual meeting of the UN Migration Network. The foundations for the network, which have been laid in 2019, with the establishment of the Secretariat, the Migration Fund, and Emergent Regional and National Networks, offer encouraging signs for 2020. The principles of its Executive Committee met recently um, in New York, and this is clearly a shared system endeavor. The Migration Partnership Trust Fund 
will be an important tool to embed the work of the network at regional and national level. I'm very grateful to those donors who have expressed a commitment to contribute thus far to the fund. I look forward, as well, to the first meeting of the Fund Steering Committee on 10 of December. It is my belief that 2020 will see further contributions from the UN system in advancing on our interpretation on how to tackle migration challenges. Yet, for the success of this endeavor, of all these endeavors, we need your support. We have set out the proposals for strengthening the internal governments, but that requires structured investment. In 2020, I wish to begin a conversation with the member states about the sustainability of IOM's budget and options for reform. With our core budget now just 2.5% of the total, IOM has reached the outer limit of what it can achieve without further invest investment. I wish to thank very sincerely all those states that have contributed a near mark and flexible funds to IOM to allow us to embark on a process of revitalization. And I hope that you will continue to trust and invest in us based on what you have heard here today. We also need your support to strengthen the top leadership of the organization so that we can realize our ambitions and we will come later to this point in the agenda of our meeting. Mr. Chair, this week we have a very packed agenda. And of course, as you all agree with me, I have already spoken too much. I'm looking forward to our discussions over the next four days and the fascinating panel discussions which will elaborate on key topics close to my heart. Long-term solutions for the internally displaced, the complex migration situation in the Sahel, and of course, the launch of the paperless World Migration Report, by the way, a USB key containing the report, which is very environmentally friendly, is in your desk. Allow me to say that it is a privilege for me to lead this organization into its next phase, a phase of consolidation, of development and success at a time when our work is ever more important and central to our collective endeavor to ensure that migration is safe, well managed, and for the benefit of all. Allow me to praise my staff, the men and women, the 13,800 men and women that are in 470 delegations in 150 countries all over the world because they are really the artisans of IOM. And I hope that on behalf of them, the organization can count on your support for this.